with last year revenues of approximately $12 billion. They operate across 35 countries across the globe and have 32,000 employees also across the globe. As Bowie said, I currently serve on the GI account, and he wasn't lying, it is one of the highlights of my career. Working with a company that is on the leading edge of transforming our world, they're committed to the community, and they're committed to excellence. And the company also fosters, motivates, and develops leaders. Rich has been at TI since 1980 in a variety of capacities, and he did start in semiconductor sales. He led the semiconductor business, and then he became the president and CEO in 2004, followed by becoming the chairman in 2008. I've, the company has seen a variety of cycles during that time period. And while I've been working with TI, I've seen rich leadership in transforming the company, restructuring the business to focus on product offerings that can sustain long-term growth, acquiring strategic businesses, and disposing non-key ones. Under his leadership, TI is poised for the future through capacity expansion, innovative and focused product offerings, and a strong financial footprint. Rich is not only a leader at TI, but a leader in the community as he gives back through his efforts focusing on science and math for young children, and with the United Way, including share, uh, chairing the Dallas campaign back in 2012-2013. He's also involved in leadership at SMU. And these efforts do not go unnoticed. In 2012, the semiconductor industry awarded Rich its highest honor, and he was also top the Institutional Investors 2014 list of best semiconductor CEOs. And it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Templeton to you. Marty, thank you. I, uh, I really do appreciate the support that uh, you, Chris, uh, EY, and really the whole team, many of which are shown here today, to provide to TI uh, the support to the conference today, but, but also, as I'll build here, the support that uh, you guys prioritize to the community. Uh, it's fun, it's important, and it makes a big difference. Uh, I also want to thank the Dallas Chamber and the other chambers for making this event possible. You guys are taking full advantage of the chance to meet one another, and, uh, and it's just critical. And we, uh, we again appreciate the, uh, the chance to be here today. Now, my interest in, in you folks as leaders, uh, in some ways, is really very simple. And that is, 10 to 20 years from now, we are going to have leaders of our companies, of our nonprofits, of our educational institutions, and of our government, government agencies. My desire is to have good leaders, as opposed to the alternative. And I say that in a very direct way. We as a country, as a community, uh, we depend on great leadership of our institutions. And so it's not an exaggeration, it's not hyperbole. Uh, we will be as good as the leaders that we put into a lot of these critical positions across the, uh, across the community. Now, as I spend time talking today about leadership, the, you know, maybe in some ways the best thing to help my perspective or to help you understand my perspective is to frame that I really think that there is a very ultimate measurement about great leaders. And that is the organizations that you lead, are they better when you are done with them than when you start? It's that simple. It's a lot of hard work, but is the organization better with them? when you uh, begin your work there. And when you do that well, and when you hand that off to the next, uh, the next folks in line, you hopefully have the cycle uh, continue and, uh, and repeat itself. Now, today I was asked to uh, speak to a couple of lessons learned that, uh, that I've had coming out of both business and life in terms of leadership. And, you know, in many ways, it's a, it's a topic that you all have experiences with already. And so some of the traits that, you know, that I think of and words that come to mind uh, are the same ones that I suspect you're gonna have. It gets to, you know, do you have good teamwork? Uh, do you really have a good sense of hard work? Uh, do you take life on as continuous learning? Uh, one of my favorites, because I think it's critical for our industry, is what's your level of curiosity? There's a classic aspect of do you have a willingness to learn really from anyone uh, that you meet, that you experience. Uh, there's attributes of do you have adaptability, uh, do you know when to compromise, uh, do 
you'll know when not to. Uh, there's a very distinct difference between being principled and being stubborn. You've got to be able to know what the difference is in some of that. Uh, anybody that's been working for very long knows the importance of strong family support. If you're not happy at home, you're not going to be happy at work and vice versa. And it takes strong support to be able to make that happen. And then maybe, you know, I know for me, most importantly, what I get to work on and who I get to work with grows more important every day uh, than I'm in business. I think I'm the luckiest person in the world. I get to work with some of the smartest folks in the world between those that work at TI, our customers and our design engineers and design chips and user chips. And, and I really do enjoy competing with the team at, uh, at TI. It really is a pleasure. So those, those things have all been important and continue to be important to me. Again, those are traits you probably can relate to. But today I really want to talk about just three uh, specific things. I want to touch on competitiveness, and very specifically, I want to talk about understanding you know what competitiveness really is. So looking a little deeper inside of it. I want to spend a minute on change, and most importantly, uh, your ability or your team's ability to embrace change to make yourself stronger. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about having a strong foundation and good balance. And, uh, and hopefully you'll understand what that means when I get to it. So let's, uh, let's start with competitiveness. And uh, you know, this is one where I get opportunities to talk to a lot of groups of leaders inside of TI. And, and I will ask to be an organization or a group like this. And, and my first test that I run is I will ask people in the room, when you hear the word competitive, and you think about people that represent competitive, what word comes to your mind, or what words come to your mind? Just think about it for a minute. Most often, the most popular answer, the one that translates almost immediately to most people, is who thought, gee, it's people that want to win. That's what stands out, it's people that want to win. It's answered that way very often. Now the challenge I'll give you, and I'll give you just a little bit of a fictional story to think about, is, and maybe it's the engineering background, but test the opposite of that wants to win as a description for competitive. So let's imagine for a minute, you got a call, you've taken over as the CEO of a company, and one of your first objectives is you want to determine, do you have competitive leaders inside your organization? So what do you do? gather them up into a conference room. What do you ask them? Show of hands, how many of you are competitive and want to win? How many hands are going to go up? All of them. But see, you guys are young professionals, so you don't stop there. You're thorough. And you decide, I'm going to discover the other side of this. And what do you ask them? Does anybody in this room want to lose? How many hands go up? I'll take the bet of none. So you then head back to your board, and what do you tell them? You say, hey, we're in good shape. I checked. <laughs> Everybody wants to win. I'm thorough. I checked. Nobody wants to lose. We're good to go. So I give that kind of silly story, and I use a lot of words to give it, but it really comes down to a very simple conclusion, and that is wanting to win is not a criteria for competitive people. It just isn't robust. Okay, it's, it's deeply lacking. So it's interesting that, and it's experience that I've had, and I've watched it, and there's actually been you know, some work done in uh, studies and, uh, and looking at different professional athletes, people in different positions. But the best test to know if somebody is truly competitive is do they hate to lose? Because, and I use that strong word of hate, because hate to lose translates to great motivation. Motivation then translates into really a passion to take action and drive forward. It leads to making change, it leads to hard work, it leads to doing unglamorous things to be able to make sure you don't lose. And, you know, to me there's a, uh, a classic phrase and some of you may have heard it, unspectacular preparation leads to spectacular results. So I, I just go down this path that 
competitiveness, it's not about wanting to win, but it's what are you prepared to do to not lose? And that's what you've got to determine when you think about yourself, you think about people inside your organization or the leaders that you need to, to have around you. If you find people that really hate to lose, that are prepared to change, you're going to find the competitors. You're going to find someone, the ones that just make it better. Now, second aspect of uh, competitiveness, and it's one that I encounter uh, very often, and many of you may have as well, is that I find it a tendency that competitive people, they know the score. And some of you have probably heard there's a famous uh, football coach that has made the statement that you are what your record says you are. Because many of you have heard sports teams and coaches and players say, ah, we got a bad call, we've had a couple of injuries, we had some bad luck. You know what, we're really better than our three and seven record indicated. Our team's better than that. Well, the fact is, if you follow groups of people or teams that say that, one, I'll show you a team that's got a losing record, and I'll also make the prediction that they'll have a losing record next year and the year after, because they haven't accepted what the score is. It, it really does come down. Competitive people, they know the score, they accept the score, they then spend the time figuring out what do I have to do different, and then they set off to be different, and they implement the changes and they get going. When you find people like that, their score is usually a better a year later, and it's better a year after that. Yet if you sit with them at the end of each of those years, they will sit there and have yet another list of all the things that aren't acceptable, that we're not good enough at, that we've got to change, and you'll think you're talking to a losing team with that list. And I remind you, it doesn't sound very balanced, but we're after competitive people, not necessarily well-adjusted people when it comes to this. <laughs> people that are competitive are driven, and they've got to learn that, that ability and that balance. So I really think the bottom line on competitiveness, find the people that hate to lose, find the people that know the score, and you're going to find yourself with a stronger team. And you're going to find yourself being able to win more often when you have people like that uh, on board. Now, second trait I want to talk about is change, and, uh, and maybe most specifically embracing, uh, embracing change. And, you know, Marty's introduction, she talked about TI, if you would have known Texas Instruments in the 1970s and the 1980s and first half of the 90s, we were in just about everything and we weren't good at just about everything. And we had to go through a lot of change, and we continued even over the past 10 years to, do, to go through a lot of change. So it's a, it's a topic that I really have spent a lot of time on, I do a lot, and I find it absolutely fascinating. Because in some ways, I, I find it so enormously simple. And that is, if you study evolutionary trends, uh, you look at history, uh, and you could study species, you could study uh, countries, you could study dynasties. It's really, there's only one conclusion. The organizations, the people, the species, those that do not evolve and change, they die. It's just clear. And I suspect if we could go out to any organization, you would get 100% of the people to agree, yep, people that do not evolve, people that do not change, they will perish. It'll be 100% agreement. Yet, for some fascinating reason, that same group that you could get to agree to that, if you said, you have to change and we have to change, they will not accept it. Because I think when all of a sudden change affects them, there's this whole different set of thought and logic that takes over. And I don't, you know, I am an engineer, not a psychologist, so I don't know the background but I have watched from experience different things that drives people resist, people's resistance to, uh, to change. One, let's just go back to what the leaders were like in the organization. And when you have leaders that really lack competitiveness, think about, know the score, think about hate to lose, I'll show you an organization that probably struggles with change because they can deny the score and make believe it isn't happening. 
you will find, and you may have experience, uh, and I see it at times, you'll find leaders that go around, you know, hand in front of their eyes. I don't see any problems out over the horizon. All looks good. And, and they just convince themselves, boy, you know, I don't, it's not part of my job to anticipate change. And if they see a loss of an account or a loss of a piece of business, they explain it away as, ah, it was unlucky or it was a one shot or, you know, something happened. As opposed to, was that an early sign of a very significant uh, set of change that's moving on inside of your organization? You've got other leaders, and you've probably experienced them, where they probably see the threat coming, but they sit back and they say, you know what, that's a lot of work, and I'm going to be off of this shift by the time that threat comes. Somebody else's problem. I'll let it pass. And I've also, and this one is a fascinating one because it's a it's a capability of really high performance people who've got tremendous intellectual ability where they can even convince themselves of things that you wouldn't imagine. But I've watched really high performance people sit back and since they're high performance, they know if you declare there's a problem, you've got to be prepared to declare I've got a solution. They don't have a solution for the problem, so they convince themselves there's really not a problem. And you laugh a little bit when you hear that, but I've seen it from some of the smartest, the most capable people that I've known. And they go back to, nope, we're okay. And so it sounds crazy, but this whole topic of change is really an interesting one that I think as leaders, you've got to be prepared, you've got to be prepared to embrace it. Because I actually think it's the most powerful thing you have in front of you. So I started by saying change is fascinating. I find it simple, but I've never associated the word easy with change. It is a hard subject. And, and I get to a very simple place with change, and maybe it's part of me being unbalanced and not very well adjusted, is I am more afraid of not changing. When I go around TI and I go around our businesses and I look at things, if people say, yeah, we're good, we don't need to change. That ought to scare you to death, okay? And it does mean I am comfortable when we have the place changing and you're out dictating different rules and you're heading in a different direction. And I, and I find it easy because back to the comment on evolutionary trends, if you don't evolve and change, there's a 100% chance you'll die, okay? I'll take the better probability of potential failure by changing path than the guaranteed failure by staying on the one that I'm on. And people, I think, struggle a little bit with that, but I, I find it really pretty, uh, pretty simple. So while it is simple, it does take courage and it does take hard work. Okay, and I, I begin with the courage thing because I really believe one of the primary responsibilities you have as leaders, it is your job to anticipate change. It is your job to look forward. It is your job to look around corners. And usually, it's not that magical because if you're paying attention to your customers or your marketplace and you're out looking for early signs and you're paying attention to them, you'll find the change that's really lurking around the corner that you've got to pay attention to. It is out there. The only question is when you're going to spot it. Do you spot it before it runs you over or do you figure out what the bus was when you're sitting back up writing the license plate down as it heads down the road? That, that is the the challenge or the opportunity you have. Second thing is that I think change is lonely as a leader. And, and I can go through it when you make that decision that you're going to head out of something and head in a different path. You will be judged, you will be criticized because there's probably going to be a fair amount of time before whether it's right or wrong really becomes apparent. So that is not a case of teamwork on that, that critical point of we are going to head down a different path. But I will tell you that that whole aspect of change and making that decision moves from that singular decision to becoming a team sport pretty quickly. You do have to assemble your closest group of people. You do have to get a group of people that agree, okay, that is a threat, that is gonna run us over, and that's a better place that we wanna go. And you've gotta get people really centered up on that. It is important to remind everyone as leaders that this is not a case of standing up in front of your entire company or organization yelling fire. OK, 
pay yours is not to scare them. You need to create the vision of where is better, what are we running to, and then you scare them. What are we getting away from? But you've got to have the destination of what are you trying to take that organization or that group of people to. And then in many ways, the steps that follow uh, are pretty well documented. You can find online data on change management. You've all probably read some of it, learned some of it. You've got to get the broad organization involved. You've got to let, get a bunch of people start to behave and act differently and move forward. And it's hard work. It's important work, but there's actually some online insight you can get from that. But the thing that I always find fascinating on online or data or experts that come in and want to tell you about change is they're good about talking about change management, but they don't focus on your role as a leader that you've got a responsibility to spot it, see it, anticipate it, and be able to have the courage to be able to make that call. It's probably a little tougher to train okay, in terms of what it, uh, what it takes to do. Now, the um, last point I want to touch on in some ways, it's two points, but to me, it's about really completing yourself and completing your values in terms of how you operate as a leader and how your company operates. And I put it under a very simple description of having a strong foundation and a good sense of balance. And, and I just, I, I break it into that because to me, the foundation, and, and to me, it's foundation of personal life and it's foundation for how we operate in TI it's got to begin, it's got to begin uh, and end with, uh, with that sense of ethics. And, you know, one of my favorite uh, little stories on, on ethics was, it was about 20 years ago, it was in the, uh, I guess it was in the late 90s, and I was chief operating officer at the time, and some of you may remember Tom Engineus, who was a CEO at the time, and we were at an open forum, uh, and there was a bunch of people asking questions, and one obviously not ready for change person Okay, stood up in the audience with that, you know, finger going, demanding, are we going to prioritize ethics or winning? Which one? Now, the good news was he asked the question to Tom. So I can sit back and watch at that point. The other good news is if you know Tom Angelus, he is a person that can say more things with fewer words than anybody that I've ever watched or, or been with. And I know I would have handled the situation terribly. I would have looked down and said, stupid question, you know, and all the things he should do. <laughs> Tom looked down very wisely and very politely and said, I have never associated losing with good ethics. Next question, and just moved on. And I give that story because it is. Ethics are a foundation to winning teams. Find a team with bad ethics, they could win in the short term, I'll show you one that five years, 10 years, somewhere down the road, they're gonna give it back because they just don't have the foundation to be able to operate the place over the longer term. So it just, it, it really is a case, folks. It's, it's gotta be the foundation that you build on. Second area I wanna address is really about prioritizing the communities that you live in. And you can broaden that into the communities or institutions that you're part of. Uh, I'm really, you know, pretty, pretty broad when I think about that definition of communities that you live and operate in. But I find it just absolutely critical that that becomes an essential element of how, I know it's an essential element of how I think, my wife and I think, and I think it's an essential element of how TI thinks. And on one hand, we're engineers, and we can get to a really clear, logical sense that obviously stronger companies drive strong communities, and the opposite occurs as well. Strong communities in turn help the company be stronger. But I think this whole issue about balance comes beyond the logic of economic prosperity for the company or for the community. And it really comes down that when you as a leader or your people, and it's why I compliment the EY team, when you as people are engaged in the community and helping other people and prioritizing other people to have a better life or a better go in life than you, you've actually made the ultimate decision and the ultimate choice. And that is, you've really decided, I want this community to be better, I want to help other people. And the interesting thing 
that I've watched and I've seen inside the organization is not only do you feel better balanced as an individual, your organization actually feels better about itself because it then has a greater sense of purpose. We get fascinated, we get passionate about our objectives at TI and what it means to win and all that, but you start adding a greater dimension of what does success really mean, and it actually takes on a much broader perspective. So just, you know, we have been fortunate at TI. Uh, if you're not from the Dallas area, uh, it is difficult to find an institution, a school, uh, you name it, that wasn't touched by the TI founders. And this is the Greens, the McDermott's, the Haggerty's, the Johnson's, we really are fortunate. I grew up inside of a company where we learned to do that from day one. So our job is to make sure we keep that going. Today, education is really one of our top focuses and top priorities. That means especially with a bias to science and technology, and especially with a bias to getting more women and minorities into STEM fields as well. So it remains a position really of great, uh, of great passion. So, you know, I sense you can uh, get my belief about the importance of competitiveness, about the importance of really having people that are willing to embrace change as leaders, and that you just have to have that. But I will tell you, it is incomplete if you don't have this foundation of ethics and you don't have that sense of balance of life that, uh, that can come along by really being committed to uh, invest in the community. So just, uh, you know, close on a couple of really pretty quick points. First, it was a pleasure, you know, to be here chance to talk to some folks that you know I'm counting on in the future so no pressure in terms of where you're headed uh, I am really pretty optimistic about the world around us and part of that is because I ignore the headlines and newspapers and on the news and try to stay on Sports Center. even that hasn't been safe lately okay? so I may have to find something new to preoccupy myself you know look at the world uh, the internet is connecting 7.1 billion people in ways that we never saw when I first got out of school back in 1980. You guys are literally a website or an app away from sending out something creative or changing the world. We never had tools that powerful to be able to make change like this. We have 5 billion of the 7 billion people coming into the economy for the first time and while you can find a world that wants to say globalization is bad, I look at it as just a wonderful opportunity. You know, people's lives are improving around the world, and it's going to translate to opportunity for those that are creative and those that are aggressive and those that are competitive and those that learn how to embrace the global world as an opportunity and not, uh, and not view it as a threat. I just, you know, I, I'm very simple in my belief, and that is that the winning businesses most impactful nonprofits, the best leading educational institutions, the government agencies that are inside the countries that are going to be growing, or the communities or the cities that are going to be growing, you're going to find leaders that are competitive, you're going to find ones that understand how to embrace change, and I think you're going to find ones that know how to really have a solid foundation and a strong sense of balance and how they lead their life and their organization. So I think it's, you know, it's hard work, it's tough to do, but I think it really is very rewarding in that, uh, in that path. So again, I look forward to how many of the folks here today are going to be on that roster of people really trying to make a change over the next 10 and 20 years. So thank you for the opportunity. I think there is a few minutes available right this shaking your head, yes, <laughs> for questions. Wait for the microphone. If you want to have fun, the next person should be in the front right. <laughs> uh, first off, thank you for coming and speaking to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I do have a question. I know a lot of us, uh, you know, maybe young professionals, young executives, getting started in our careers, expanding, looking to go to that next step. And you had said something a while ago <clears throat> that I, I truly believe in, and that is there's a lot of aspects of leadership that cannot be taught and it's just something that's in you, being able to see around that corner, being able to anticipate. And a lot of us, uh, we might be looking to go to that next step, uh, moving from you know, the position we're in to 
uh, you know, a more leadership role, whether it's at the same company, whether it's going from being an entrepreneur to taking a role in a larger company. Our skill sets don't always fall into place on the check boxes, you know, in HR departments. How do our skills as leaders and uh, competitive people get noticed by larger companies like yours? You know, I don't have uh, I don't have great answers, but I'll tell you, resumes and interviews are lousy techniques. <laughs> you guys all know that, okay? Uh, what's the best way to know what the potential track record or output of a person is going to be? It's going to be by knowing the person and seeing the work that they've done and understanding the impact they've had. And that's you know, I think that'll go on for a long time. So. How that connection gets done, I think, is always probably more uh, mystery, more whimsical than one wants. Um, but I, I do know it's not about how do you go through an HR department or how do you go to resume writing. It really is the body of work you have. And so to me, I put that, that focus back on you or the emphasis back on you. Just let it rip in terms of what you're doing. And drive like mad, make a big impact, and I think what you may mysteriously find is opportunity presents itself to you as opposed to you trying to find that one you want to grab. And because you're busy and you're going, and all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, the fork in the road has arrived, and maybe I need to, maybe I need to make one of those choices or take a look at a different, uh, different opportunity. Yeah, Jeff, you want to So you've been with uh, TI for over 30 years, so I think it would be safe to assume that over that time period, you've uh, had a lot of opportunities presented to you to leave uh, for other opportunities. I'm sure a lot of us as young professionals are at the point in our career where we're being sought after. Um, yeah, so what kind of advice do you have? What kind of thoughts did you have throughout your career that led to you staying with TI? Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not very different than the one I just described, and that is uh, drive like mad, be busy. And, and my separation was always, and I even give this advice to, you know, people with the past today inside of TI, don't leave for a little bit better. <laughs> Put the bar higher. You know, if you're going to change companies, change courses, make it be a really you know, you can't turn it down. As opposed to, well, I get that, you know, first section management job I wanted. I, I find that uh, short, uh, short of yourself for what your potential is and that opportunity is. So, I, you know, I think that's as, as wise of advice to use on that, which is, you know, don't, don't be talked into just incremental change. I don't think that's really healthy. Make sure it's something that really does take you to a very different place. That is, I find that hard, you know, how do you look at a person and say you shouldn't take on something of that significant magnitude because the contrast is, well, we must not be presenting that person with that, with that similar type of opportunity. If you could pass it down. You spoke about how important it is to see change and respond to it. And so how can we as young professionals who may not necessarily be in the decision-making position encourage those who are currently there to respond to change and to take action? You know, step one that I would encourage is don't wait to practice. And what I mean by that is you're actually in a perfect position today where you can look out and say, I think that is the cannonball, not the beat, okay? And that's the one we ought to be ducking and we ought to be doing this and that. If the organization doesn't go there, that's fine. But you've now got a perfect lab experience to find, experiment to find out, did you get that call right? And you get to go out a year or two and find out, oops, you know, guess I picked the BB, it wasn't a cannonball. And I, I say that not to put off the leadership, but don't wait to learn. Don't wait to build instincts of, wait a minute, this is what I should have been looking for. This was the sign of small change that, you know, way, way behind that was something much bigger. Uh, because, you know, you can be practicing that stuff 
right now, and you don't have to wait on that front. I don't have great advice on, on that influence upward. And uh, I suspect I was probably impatient and a pain in the butt. Um, and I just, and I just went. And, but I also know there are certain restrictions of, you know, depending on where you are in the organization, of how much stuff you can just take and where you can go with it. So I think you, you do what you can, uh, be clear about what your opinion is and, and direct about it. And then, you know, and I am a big believer in teamwork. When somebody says, okay, but, you know, here's the play we're running, then you get back and you, you run the play because you will be more successful as a group in unison than if you have everybody, you know, running to their own uh, sheet music on that. So it's a bit of a schizophrenic a bit of advice, but I think that's <laughs> Time for one more question. You get to decide. <laughs> so you talked about three traits today. Can you kind of talk about how you make sure that your company and you are executing on that on a global basis so that you're serving your customers or your employees the same way as you are in Dallas around the world? Yeah, you know, though I think it's it's one of these things that, you know, as I think of Marty's introduction, what is it, 35, 70, whatever number of countries all which have their own culture. Uh, and you probably see a little bit as you spend time with TI. Uh, yes, we have many, many different cultures in terms of where people are from, uh, but we actually have a single culture in many ways as a company, and you can see it as you go around the world. I don't think there's any magic. And a lot of it, I believe, comes down to, and some of it to me goes into uh, kind of a detailed part of the change management. I don't believe in fanning out information down through hierarchical levels. Uh, if we're making a choice of where to go as a company, if we're shaping important characteristics, and you better be pretty consistent with those because you don't get to change those over a long period of time. Um, you need to take that information out to the entire organization. You don't hand it to somebody that works for you so they can then hand it down because I guarantee what comes out the bottom of the organization they didn't know anything like when you sit down at the top. So you really have to go take those fan outs, the deployment of strategy, the deployment of where you're going as a company, uh, the processes by which you review performance and keep score and, and judge how people are behaving. Uh, you've got to find a way to do that in a highly parallel manner so it's going non-hierarchically uh, across the shop. And then I think you can get uh, actually pretty quick behavior despite having 30-odd thousand folks in the uh, Okay. Folks, thank you again. Appreciate it. Good luck. Rich Sibbleton, thank you so much, not just for the wonderful work with the leadership in the Dallas Fort Worth community, the global community. Um, he talked about it a little bit of how much Texas Instruments, and I would say it has increased it over the years, of growing new future leaders. And you can tell his dedication just from taking time out of his schedule to come speak to a group like this, he really means it. But then you look at the levels of what your organization's done on recruiting females to the engineering field, working with students, and really going to that base level of how do these first graders, second graders, and third graders start loving that. How do they start loving science? They'll just partner with Plato Independent School District to help growing that and in their critical factors. And so on behalf of that, he talks about it a lot, but he walks the walk. And as we've heard other speakers talk today, do your job, do the work, and show it. You're showing it, and we might very much appreciate it. On behalf of the Dallas Regional Chamber, thank you so much for everything you do, and thank you for your time today.